Good afternoon and welcome to the second session of today's webinar. My name is Alanza Zugalan and I'm a member of the BuildUp editorial board. BuildUp is Europe's largest international portal for energy efficiency and renewable energy in buildings. It is a unique community that provides the opportunity to discuss, contribute and collaborate with other experts in this field. BuildUp aims to bring together stakeholders working in the building sector to re-up the collective intelligence about energy reduction in buildings by encouraging knowledge exchange. Our editorial work is organized around the top a topic of the month, which allows us to dig deeper into specific themes. Each month, several items are produced by BuildUp, such as overview on technical articles, infographics, but that's not all. BuildUp also offers the opportunity to host webinars on topics related to energy efficiency and renewable energy in buildings. More recently, BuildUp has opened the opportunity to distinguish experts in the field to share their knowledge in front of our cameras in our BuildUp expert talks. The BuildUp portal shares daily the most relevant events in the field of energy efficiency and renewable energy but we also participate actively in many European events around the year, such as EPB Center and RIVA conferences, Horizon 2020, Interreg and Cost Action events, Covenant of Mayors, and much more, with the aim of further disseminating the results and helping to create high-quality media content. The Build-Up Portal is updated daily, reaching around 120 new items each month, including news, events, publications, articles, and video content. But BuildUp is not only us. BuildUp is a community and we invite you to be part of it. By becoming a member, you can contribute by uploading your own content and promoting your news, events, case studies, reports, and more. By contributing content, BuildUp uh, will help you to reach a broader audience through our online portal, our social media channels, and our monthly newsletter. Visit us at www.buildup.eu to find out more. It is a pleasure for BuildUp to host the second webinar of the Circular Talks webinar series entitled Let's Talk Circular Social and Affordable Housing, brought to you by the Drive Zero project. Today's double webinar session aims to unravel how circular principles are used in social and affordable housing today. What are the challenges, the good practices, and what should be changed in the EU policy framework? The webinar of this afternoon is the second session of today's webinar entitled Mainstreaming Circularity in the Social Housing Sector, the Role of the EU, European Union and will give the opportunity for some of the early adopters of circular processes to showcase their work to EU policymakers and to provide feedback on the current direction and scope of the EU policy with regard to upscaling and mainstreaming circularity within the residential housing sector. For this afternoon agenda, Dara Turnbull, Research Coordinator at Housing Europe, will begin by welcoming all attendees and give a short overview of the household project. This will be followed by a presentation on what the current EU strategy for boosting circularity in the residential housing sector is by Philip Mosley, Police Officer, Sustainable Industrial Policy and Construction at DG Grow in the European Commission. After Philippe's presentation, we will hear from Carles Oliver Barceló, architect uh, at the Institut Balear de l'Habitage, about locally sourced and circular social housing in the Balearic Islands. Isabel Cuetjamón, head of the Sustainable Housing Department at Paris Habitat, will then discuss bringing value back to existing construction materials in the Parisian social housing. This will be followed by Hugo de Fres, um, Development Manager, uh, Area Vonen, who will discuss resource efficient and circular Dutch social housing. The final presentation will be from Rafael Brun, architect from La Société de Logement de la Région de Bruxelles Capital, on coordination, coordinating the move to a more circular system in the social housing system in Brussels. We will round off the afternoon session with a Q&A session for the promotion of shared learning and feedback on the current EU policies moderated by Dara Turnbull. We invite the audience of BuildUp to send us questions through the GoToWebinar platform that can be answered during the Q&A session at the end. Please specify which presenter your question is for 
or if it's for all speakers. We remind you that we will, you will be able to find the recording on the Build Up portal on our YouTube channel in the coming days together with the presentation slides. And now I move directly to our moderator, Dara Turnbull. The floor is yours. Thank you very much and enjoy. Thank you very much for that introduction. I'll try and move to the main content as quickly as possible, but just a few words first about uh, Housing Europe. Uh, Housing Europe, for those of you who don't know, is the European Federation of Public, Cooperative and Social Housing Providers. We represent uh, around 43,000 local providers of social, cooperative and public housing right across Europe, both inside and outside the European Union. And indeed, we're very, very happy to be joined by four of those providers uh, here today from Uden in the Netherlands, from Brussels in Belgium, from the Blairic Islands in Spain, and indeed from Paris in France. Um, today's session is also a cooperation led by the Houseful EU project, which is a Horizon 2020 project, which is testing deep renovation toolkits with a circular emphasis in projects in Austria and in Spain. Uh, we're also happy to be cooperating with BuildUp, of course, and our partners in sister projects, Jive Zero and Arv. So thank you very, very much. And without further ado, we can move to our first uh, speaker of the session. Our first speaker is uh, Philippe Mosley. He works in Brussels at the European Commission's Director General for Internal Market, Industry, Entrepreneurship and SMEs, more colloquially referred to as DG Grow. He is responsible for policies related to the competitiveness of the construction industry and its green transition, including, very important for today's event, fostering a circular economy and reducing life cycle greenhouse gas emissions. Prior to joining the Commission in 2014, Philippe practiced as a professional architect and urbanist in the private sector for over 15 years. Philippe, thank you very, very much for joining us for this session, and I give you the floor. Philippe, I don't know if you can hear us or you're having some connected connection issues. I see that your microphone is off. Philippe, maybe uh, you can turn your microphone on. Philippe, hopefully you can hear us. Yes, we see you, but we don't yet hear you. Hello. Uh, Perfect. Now, now do, we hear you. Do the organizers need me to start uh, now? Am I ready to start? Yes, yes please go please. ahead. Philippe, if you, I don't know if you can hear us. You can, you can go ahead. You can. You already have the controls. You you just have to click in the in the screen, and you will you will be able to manage the the controls. I'm not sure that Philippe uh, hears us well. Maybe you can move to the second slide, and he'll he'll understand. Hmm. Yes. You can go ahead, Philip. Can you hear us? I think you might have trouble hearing us. Yes. These things are. Yes, these things, apologies for, for attendees. Sometimes these technical issues happen. We, we spent oh, so much uh, time. Yes. I'm, I'm, am I supposed to start presenting? Can the organizers please uh, tell me if, I, if I'm if i ready to start? Please, Philip. Yeah, okay, thank you. Right, um, 
My name is Philippe Mosley. I work in the construction unit at DG Crow, which is the European Commission's uh, uh, Directorate General for Internal Markets and Industry. And I'm responsible for uh, policies dealing with the green transition of construction, uh, which means uh, circular economy primarily, but also uh, work on the life cycle emissions and, uh, and also I follow the energy and climate files. And um, I'll go right into it. Uh, I hope you can see my second slide there. Um, the, the context of the uh, European policies in this area are, first of all, um, the, the major uh, political imperative we have coming from the Circular Economy Action Plan and, uh, and the overall priorities of this uh, underlying commission um, to uh, implement the European Green Deal and uh, to, uh, in, in the sense of industry, to ensure that the circular economy and the wider green transition is, uh, is maintaining European leadership in this area. Um, so it's not only about um, uh, being friendly to the environment, it's also about our competitiveness and uh, making sure that our industries are, are working efficiently. And that's especially true for construction. Then we have the, the legislative context has been changing very quickly in this area, again as a result of, of many uh, and new policies implemented uh, by ourselves at the Commission uh, in line with these kinds of priorities. So we've had quite a number of revisions of, of directives and regulations and as well as new initiatives coming, uh, coming on stream now. Then we also have uh, the context of, of construction having a huge environmental impact. It's the single biggest source of waste in the European Union. And uh, the Eurostat statistic is 37% of all EU waste is coming from construction and demolition. It's also a, a big uh, user of natural resources. And of course, um, in, the, in, the, in the sense of buildings during their construction and demolition and their operation, they also generate greenhouse gas emissions, um, but also the, the embodied emissions of construction and demolition also come through in infrastructure works as well. Um, and then we, we see very much uh, the circular economy as a, an industrial opportunity. Um, so uh, there are new business models that are uh, that can be created and, and it's a really a, a big opportunity for us to, um, to, to hold on to. The European construction industry is one of the 14 industrial ecosystems identified in the EU industrial strategy. And uh, it represents uh, almost 10% of gross added value. It's actually the second largest of the 14 ecosystems identified. Only retail is larger. And uh, you can see there are millions of jobs, millions of companies, um, but at the same time, a historically low productivity in construction, uh, a low uptake of innovation. This is a, uh, these are problems that are linked to the, the nature of construction being very fragmented with a dominance of uh, very small companies, even micro enterprises. And, um, and as I said before, that the environmental impact is another issue. For all of these reasons, we've prepared uh, a document which was published last year, uh, sorry, last month uh, in March, uh, called um, the Transition Pathway for Construction. Um, and this is the, a document which uh, is structured uh, along the right side of the, of the screen there, you can see the agenda, uh, sorry, the, the table of contents. Um, it, it, picks up uh, all of the relevant policies at the EU level. Um, so it, it, first of all, provides a vision and puts all of the policies together in one place. Um, but also one of the key things about this document is it makes recommendations for further action, either by the EU or uh, action at member state level or by industry. And so uh, we can see here a typical a part of one of the tables in the transition pathway with the recommendations for action, the actors that would carry out this action and, and the suggested timeframe. So I stress that these are 
recommendations, not necessarily commitments to action by the Commission. Um, but on the other hand, they are recommendations that have come from the extensive consultation process that we held as part of the preparation of the transition pathway. We, we worked on this and consulted for uh, more than a year. Uh, and these actions that I've highlighted here are the ones most relevant to uh, advancing the circular economy and construction. So you can see there's a recommendation there to set new targets for construction demolition waste for the specific waste fractions of the different types of materials. Um, also, uh, a general recommendation to prioritise renovation over demolition and reconstruction. And, and this is one of the things that we've been finding in the uh, consultation to the transition pathway uh, in the context of policies like the renovation wave, is that it's likely that uh, there will need to be more of an emphasis on renovation uh, of buildings than on construction of new buildings. Uh, and that's for, for several reasons, but including for this um, uh, the, the reason of, of the circular economy and waste. Then uh, we see their um, recommendation to strengthen requirements on pre-demolition audits. Uh, and we already have a guidance document for that, uh, the Construction Demolition Waste Management Protocol. Um, then we see a, a recommendation to invest in maintenance and Basically, extending the service life of buildings or infrastructure works is the single biggest measure we can take to uh, prevent waste, uh, is avoid buildings needing to be demolished at all. So the more we can maintain them and infrastructure works and extend their service life, the more we push back the date when they would eventually need to be demolished and create waste. Uh, and then we also have uh, a lot of material in the transition pathway about data, life cycle data, life cycle analysis, and the use of the levels framework to measure on report on buildings uh, environmental performance. We have uh, a revision ongoing now of probably the single most important uh, piece of legislation dealing with the circular economy and construction. Uh, that's the circular, the, the construction products regulation, the CPR. So there are two main purposes to this revision. The first of all, to improve the functioning of the single market for construction products. Basically, when products are placed on the market in a member state, uh, According to the regulation, they should be uh, they should be harmonised across the whole single market. The ability to market construction products uh, that's one of the principles of the single market. It's not functioning as well as it should for various reasons. There are legal uh, and other administrative problems with the current functioning of it. So part of the revision is simply to address that. But uh, for our talk today on the circular economy. And the other interesting and important part of the CPR revision is sustainability requirements um, to level the playing field between uh, products which are environmentally sustainable or which, um, for example, have circular features to them, such as recycle content or reuse, uh, or that they've been designed to be deconstructed in future, that these could be marketed uh, and, and the criteria along these lines and environmental performance of products are recorded uh, digitally. So just to go into the CPR a little bit, uh, the way it works overall, um, we have an overarching uh, regulation for all products called the ESPR at the top there, the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation. And that is um, uh, the, the regulation that um, deals with all products, all consumer products. Um, and and in, within that, we have the new concept being developed of the digital product passport. So we would have digitalized information on products that is then able to be used in the whole life cycle. The CPR, uh, because construction products are rather unique in that the construction product is not the end, uh, the end result is the building or the construction works or the bridge, tunnel, whatever it is, 
that the product, the construction product is part of. Um, so they're, they're a particular category of product, and that's why we have a separate regulation for them. So the information uh, coming from uh, the construction product uh, regulation can then be used in tools such as levels to assess the sustainability of buildings according to the methodology and levels. Uh, and also you can have uh, national approaches, uh, the data coming from products or from the levels calculations can be used in things like public procurement um, or uh, environmental assessment uh, methods for, for buildings. When just diving into a little bit more detail on what the CPR revision is looking at, uh, specifically for circular economy. Um, these are the articles that are uh, dealing with the various different aspects. So as you can see here, we're looking to clarify the conditions for marketing of products, um, in in including used, or reused or remanufactured construction products. Uh, there's a, an article in there in the revision proposal on uh, dismantle construction products and how that would be done information on, on their reuse and their repairability, so information facilitating a circular economy. Um, more flexibility then on, um, for example, uh, used products entering the market so they don't have to uh, undergo all of the, the, the tests and so on and certifications that a new product would have to do. Um, and then uh, permitting a second life, so for example, uh, products that have been delivered to the building site but are not needed at the moment, they just get thrown in the bin, as it were, they just go to waste. Um, so we would officially, you know, facilitate their, their reuse. Uh, and then also, uh, overall, we're looking to close material cycles uh, with things like the deposit refund schemes. Another very important um, piece of legislation that has just been published in draft form, uh, the EU Taxonomy for Sustainable Activities. We already have the criteria for climate change adaptation and mitigation. Uh, so that includes for, for those of you who are developing um, buildings and housing, and we have the criteria there uh, for building developments and renovations enforced since January. We now have the proposal to add to that with more criteria on uh, specifically for construction and buildings. It would be the circular economy part. Uh, it says expected soon on the slide, but they were published uh, uh, only a few few days ago, uh, the draft criteria. Important to say, that if any um, housing developers are looking to align with the taxonomy, they can choose whether to align with the climate uh, criteria or with the circular economy criteria or both. It's voluntary. Uh, you don't have to conform with all of it all at once. You can choose one or the other. Um, and in here, uh, I've put in this slide, uh, the draft delegated act, which is now up for consultation until the 3rd of May. So by all means, have a look at this and see whether uh, what do you think of it? Um, these are the criteria for circular economy related to construction of new buildings and renovation of buildings. And so they would uh, include these provisions on treatment of waste, so pre-demolition audits, sorting of waste, preparing, and so on. Uh, a requirement to calculate and disclose the life cycle emissions. Um, a requirement to prove that the design of the building or the renovation is uh, adaptable and uh, could be deconstructed in future, and there's a methodology for that. And then one of the most important parts here, the recycled content threshold. And these have been done where the top three materials used in the project by weight would, be, would have uh, um, maximum thresholds applied to them of percentage of virgin raw materials uh, and those are detailed in in the document and then finally uh, the use of electronic tools so this is really trying to encourage the industry to use uh, digital product data for example um, that, that would have then uh, de details available of the makeup of, of the construction works 
We also have, uh, in two days' time, a session of the High Level Construction Forum where uh, various uh, upcoming and, and ongoing um, pieces of work for the Commission are going to be discussed. So the, the roadmap on whole life carbon of buildings, which we're working on, um, is going to be, uh, there's going to be some modelling presented, the background work to support the roadmap development. Um, there's also a study ongoing on measuring circular approaches, which I, I've got a slide on that in a second. Another study on end of waste criteria. These are the uh, criteria to define in legal terms when waste stops being called waste and starts being called a secondary material. And if any of you want to um, uh, join the High Level Construction Forum, you can sign up for a mailing list with that link there. And uh, then you will get the mailings of these kinds of events that we hold uh, regularly, not only on circular economy, but on, on all kinds of subjects dealing with construction. So here's the, the study I mentioned on um, measuring the application of circular approaches in construction. What this study is doing is trying to um, understand better what the industry is doing in practice uh, to apply circular approaches. So we have things like Eurostat statistics on waste and other very high level data, um, but we don't know in detail um, what the industry is doing and why um, and also how they're measuring what they're doing. So this study is, is looking at that. How can we measure uh, what the industry is doing in terms of circular economy? Uh, I think this is my final slide. We have the guidance uh, on construction and demolition waste which has been published now since 2016 so it's getting a little bit old but it's still very relevant and uh, it's available in, in multiple languages we're planning a revision of this now um, so we will update it with some more recent case studies and uh, in light of, of recent policy developments but in the meantime it's it's a highly Rega well regarded document it was drafted and prepared together with industry and member states um, so by all means um, make reference to that if you need in, in in your project and there we are that's my last slide it's just uh, you can see the link there to our website of our unit where you see the uh, the work that we are doing in the commission thank you very much Right. Thank you very much. I hope uh, hope you yes, can hear us. I, I realised I can't hear anyone else, so I will try and uh, I'll try and get out of go to webinar, come straight back in. Perfect. Hopefully, I'll be able to take some questions. Okay. So while Philippe deals with technical issues, we're going to move swiftly on to our next uh, presenters. So. <clears throat> Moving from Brussels to the Balearic Islands, where I'm sure the weather is quite a bit better than it is here today. Uh, we have uh, Kales and uh, David, both of whom are architects at uh, the Balearic Social Housing Institute, IBAVI. Um, and we're really looking forward to their presentation because they're doing some really exciting work on the circular economy. Um, so please, uh, Kales and David, over to you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much also for your kind invitation. We're very pleased to be here with you. And we want to excuse the presence of Chris Ballester, which is the General Director of Housing, the Balearic Islands Government, who has made possible the introduction of circularity in this new social housing um, stock that we are developing. And we are going to explain how. Hey. How we introduce that? Is that working? Picking? Hola? I think you have to click once and then you can move side to side. Okay. okay. Yes. So, as Dara explained, we work for the IBAVI, which is the social housing institute in the Balearic Islands. And um, the examples that we're going to explain, they are not in a kind of a marginal experimentation process. They are part of the highest uh, increase of the housing uh, park that we developed in the last years. So in 2019, we were having 1,700 units, and the goal was to increase in a 50%, but we achieved the 72%, which is to build about 
1,100 housing. So with a budget of 200 million, so is the highest budget we ever had. And this is the history of the um, uh, construction for the Valerac, uh, uh, for the Ibavi Institute during the last years. And this is what we've done these four last years. So we're going to start with the first research project that we developed called Library Using Posidonia, which was uh, granted by the LIFE program from the European Commission. And there we wanted to explain that we don't inhabit a house, but an ecosystem. So to explain how can we uh, provide um, low, low carbon uh, solutions from the local map of resources, in that case, using, for instance, just as an example, the Posidonia as thermal insulation on the roofs of this housing. And basically today we're going to talk about two indicators. One is the demand of the energy for heating and cooling. So we're not going to use the carbon dioxide emissions, but the demand because we want to reduce um, uh, the demand from the architecture. So then we can use less energy um, to heat and uh, to cool the, the, the buildings. And the carbon dioxide emissions um, for the embodied energy that is produced during the construction. Okay, so these are the results for this project in Formentera that we reduced uh, the embodied carbon emissions uh, 60%, but providing a kind of architecture that is very related to the place and of course we monitor it. And it got um, the Life Award 2021 in the environment um, category. So the result of this first research project is that probably we had to change the language of the architecture in every place. So we people see and think through a language and since there are 7,000 languages spoken in the world, we believe that every place should develop an own language for its architecture, which means that probably every place has to work with its own map of resources that comes from the heritage, from the local heritage. That means that in our case, we're working with this material that you can see on the screen, which are stone, earth. We have to recover wood because we don't have it right now. Neptune grass, Poseidon Oceanica, and demolition resources in the cases that they happen. So actually, we're talking mostly about artisan local produced products for local markets that probably they will need a different regulation to prevent its extinction. And we want to show that it is possible to work with these materials without CE mark, because they are part of some of the exceptions to use these materials, and how it has been possible to use these materials to provide about 1,000 new dwellings, which is how are we going to go from this 14 uh, dwellings from Formentera to 1,000 sustainable social housing units in four years. As I explained before, that has been possible thanks to the management of Chris Ballester, who had made possible to achieve the two goals, which is providing dwellings to face the housing emergency and also try to face the climate emergency. So the first material we're going to explain is the local sandstone, and this is a quarry that is a kind of material that it's covering like 20% of the surface of the island. And right now, there are only 12, eight, eight quarries um, that are working. 12 quarries have closed the doors during the last 12 years. So we're talking about the material that is an example of circularity, but right now it's under extinction. It's a kind of local product that is going to disappear in 10 years if we don't change even when it becomes the vernacular institutional local landscape. So the first building we're going to show is this eight social dwellings in Palma, in the city of Palma. But as you can see, it has a very low um, energy demand for cooling and heating, and it has been built totally with the local sandstone and other local materials. This is a ground floor dwelling, this is the, the living room, the first floor, and the patio. So everything has been built with this local stone. And this is the first 
stage and this is the second stage. So as you can see, we're not only building in low carbon materials, but also providing a landscape related to the place. And it has been insulated once again with the Posidonia, which is covered as usual with the proper tiles. We are in the process trying to design not entirely new, but more refined in order to make as feasible and cheap and possible these kind of buildings. So this is another building of six dwellings in Santa Eugenia, which in this case has this trombi wall as a way to provide um, the winter renovation of air for the dwellings. As you can see, the energy demand goes down to 4.8, so these are very efficient buildings, despite of the fact of being built with local materials. And you can see that here, what we've done is repetition. It's very important to introduce a standardization and repetition in local materials. So with something as simple as using always the same columns at the same distance, we make feasible to make a, a stone building faster, cheaper, easier, and more refined. As you can see, all the windows in the facade are the same, and this is the way that we're recovering the technique for the local sandstone vaults. This is under construction, and this is with the building in use with the people living already in the housing. And this is the first floor. All the wood you can see here is recycled wood. So it's local sandstone and recycled wood. We're using the most advanced tools in order to be sure about the comfort inside the dwellings. And thanks of the effort of the Bavi, uh, some of the quarries that they were going to, to close the doors, they are providing like new technology in order to keep on working with that. Okay. So the, the second material that we that we are promoting here from Ibabi is the clay that has a, a local production and sadly has been replaced uh, during the last years for concrete blocks. So the first product that we have used using this material uh, sorry, is this building um, in Ibiza that use thermoclay blocks and the the energy demand, sorry, yeah, and the um, thermoclay blocks uh, produced by biomass um, energy. And uh, we have achieved uh, heating and cooling energy demand of only 4.5 kilowatts per meter per year. So we could say that it's almost zero. Um, these are the architects who designed this, this project. As And as you can see here, with, yeah, in this in this diagram is a very compact building that that through these four uh, atriums helps cooling, uh, creating a greenhouse effect the uh, the units during winter. So these are the images of these atriums, and the the relationship uh, between the the landscape, the outside, and these atriums uh, on the left side. Another material that we're working, of course, is wood. Uh, even right now, is not locally produced, but we expect that we're going uh, to help to the local markets to start producing this wood. So the first building we're going to show is this building that has um, a wood structure designed by Jock Architectures that won the competition of Ibavi, and this is the wood structure and how the building is finished and the people is already living in there. The, the second project that we are using wood uh, is this project in, in Binisalem, here in Mallorca. And um, this is the north facade and the south facade that you see here that the windows are bigger and uh, they are used as solar captures. These are the architects who designed it, these are the architects. And the most interesting thing of this building is these two systems that are used. So uh, they are using a core, a central core of timber structure that it helps to uh, build much faster and, easy, and easier. And in the perimeter, in the facade, they, they propose these galleries made out of sandstone, our, our local stone, that help with the thermal inertia and with integration into the landscape. So here you have a picture of this internal uh, layout using the timber structure. 
and these areas on the perimeter with the vaults uh, made out of stone. Because you see one of the problems we are facing on the territories of the Mediterranean Sea is that sometimes wood is not related like to the climate conditions and to the life landscape um, conditions of our places. So another of the materials we're using are these ram earth blocks that we have used in this project in Ibiza. These are for the three dwellings and five stories. That means that all the structure has been produced with these ram earth blocks with a very low energy demand once again. And these are the architects, very sterile. And this is how these, these walls can uh, load bear the structure thanks to the classical techniques and you have to recover the technique of doing these walls in order to design these kind of spaces. With galleries for the comfort, with galleries, with collective galleries, and also the Posidonia as thermal insulation in the roof. Um, another way of using earth that we have been experimenting is with ram earth walls. So basically, instead of a precast block made of earth is in situ, it's just uh, by compacting the, the earth. So it's described here in Palma of six dwellings uh, designed by Angels Castellarnau and Jose Cunesc. And, and the most interesting thing of, of this project is that they use the demolition, well, not the demolition, the, um, the excavation from another project of Ibavi that we, we had to excavate to create a car park to use, uh, to create these walls. Let's see if it works. Yeah, these, these walls uh, that create the layout of the, of the dwellings. And here we see an image of, I think two months ago when uh, you can see already the relationship between the image and the, and the final product. We're going to explain now some projects of um, temporary co-housing units, like this one in Menorca, another of the Balearic Islands. They have a different like vernacular style, so every project tries to fit in its place. And as you can see in this project by Moj Architects, these very young architects, they are providing uh, these very traditional patios to have better living conditions as these terraces. And this project is using urban mining that is actually very related to what uh, Philip was uh, explaining and is how to use the waste from an existing building when we are going to, to build a new one. So this is the this case is very important to explain that the existing building was out of the urban regulations, so it was not possible to keep the building. So as you can see here, this is the, the previous building that was made of this stone, uh, local stone that we explained before. Um, and what we did is uh, create a new building using this waste. Um, this is the final image. These are the architects who designed the project, architects. And here you can see the process of uh, how by pouring um, uh, Lime, lime concrete with the pre existing uh, stone, we can create these blocks that during construction. We, we create these blocks and we are stacking one on top of each other. We create the, the layout of the, of the apartments, as you can see here in the plan. Each architects are one of the most innovative uh, studios in Spain as well. These uh, young architects from Taller Onze that designed this other project in Formentera, which is not using um, the waste from the same building, but the waste from other buildings. So they're going to reuse uh, different stuff uh, in order to make these very thick walls, which are going to reuse the waste from other from other demolition projects, and they're going to have these lime walls that contain all these recycled aggregated. And as usual, a lot of sun, um, sun captation and the south. And what we want to explain that this is just a part of the bunch of buildings that we are designing in this line. So this is not an isolated experiment. And if you want more information, you can find um, 
this book that has been recently published by a Crocus editorial and probably the first uh, edition of a Crocus that includes the carbon dioxide emissions per square meters of all the projects and the energy demand. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you, Carlos, for a very, very uh, interesting presentation. You covered a lot of information very, very quickly, so fair, well, fair play to you, as you say, in Ireland. Um, moving on to our next speaker, so moving from Blair Gardens to Paris, uh, we have uh, Isabelle Quetamont, who is the head of Sustainable Housing Department at Paris Habitat. She's also an architect, so we've had uh, four architects now on, on the call out of four speakers. Uh, and I believe that she's also joined uh, this afternoon by her colleague uh, Ariane, who will uh, also provide some information about the work of Paris Habitat. So please, uh, over to you, uh, Isabel. It's not my presentation. I think you have to, yes, I think, Emily, you have to move forward to get to Isabel's presentation. Keep moving forward. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Bonjour. So just a few words to introduce Paris Habitat. Uh, who are we and why are we involved in circular economy in our construction and renovation projects? So Paris Habitat is the first public social housing company in France with 126 dwellings mainly located in our Paris. Um, so, um, we used to say that we house one Parisian out of nine, and um, we have a um, very um, diversified housing stock and an old one. You can see on that slide uh, uh, the diversity of our heritage from the beginning of last century to our days. The average buildings. Um, is 74 years old, the average housing unit 61. So there is an important need of refurbishment to match with today's issues. From global renovation to punctual actions. Also, Paris is a very small city with a high density and high demand for housing. In terms of development, Paris is very restrictive because of the lack of lands and this density. So we have to do with what we said the already there, which is a real challenge, but which is also very interesting. And um, that's why this, this is a reason for, for, the, for us to uh, be interested by the circular economy. In our activities, our commitments for a low carbon city is strong. And the fight against climate change leads us to innovate and change the paradigm. That's why for, we are focused on preserving the resources using low carbon materials and construction files and processes. The second life of building and reuse are one way to do for us. Uh, materials reusing has been experimented on a few projects already with several materials, usually uh, mostly second work. It has been implemented at a larger scale on the Caserne de Reuilly, which was an old military barrack with new constructions and uh, renovation projects. This was a great opportunity for us to create a dynamic around the, 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 economy, the circular economy. The reused materials were mostly cast iron, radiators, wooden cupboards, panels, stoneware pavers, slates wash basins, sorry, lights, steel grids. And this is, was possible because of the high quality of the materials. So our goal uh, is to integrate in the Paris Habitat asset management, a circular methodology to increase the, the part of reused materials. That's why we are committed through the CHAM project, which is the European project uh, with um, European partners, four social housing companies from France, England, Belgium, and Holland, and also sub partners for the so, so dissemination. Uh, the, goals, the CHAM goals uh, are the following, develop circular economy of buildings and materials reusing 
among social housing companies, promote the development of circular sectors and stakeholders, systematize, systematize materials reading on every housing operation. Uh, in this project, Paris Habitat experiment materials we're using on five demonstration sites. So different uh, projects uh, such as renovation, demolition, and also construction. Uh, we experiment materials we're using also on the refurbishment of dwellings before rental. We have uh, um, uh, 5,000 5, um, um, dwellings units uh, to rent uh, each year. Structure, we structure circular strategy on materials we're using uh, to integrate circularity requirements. And at last, uh, develop a material platform for Paris, for Paris Habitat materials to facilitate the, the opportunities to reuse. So this is the front, uh, front page. page of the of the the platform. We had already an internal platform uh, which was called Ecosystem. That, that one is called uh, Reflex, Reflex Par Habitat. Um, the first one was not very used because not available to architects and builders. The purpose of that uh, new one is to, to, to be open to open data to the architects and to the builders. So to facilitate, facilitate the circularity, the exchange, and also um, for the um, one of the goal is try to exchange. The first one is try to exchange a material in the first place between uh, different sites of Paris Habitat. If it's not possible, we sell it through marketplace. Uh, Specialized in the in the we using uh, and the exchange uh, materials. And if no buyer is interested, um, we try to donate the material to uh, to association to um, in, uh, in NGO. NGOs. So on that slide, you can see the five uh, uh, five demonstration sites. From it goes from light renovation to transformation including demolition and reconstruction. We have also um, a demo total demolition with uh, new construction. For example, uh, in one site, we transform the wooden uh, interior doors or landing doors to uh, furniture, to circular kitchen furniture. Here you can see the old the PVC windows, uh, which is placed in, in uh, interior in uh, as an interior bay window, and also the uh, old uh, existing door, which is uh, reused. Another example of demonstration site: it's a, uh, a barrack and uh, with a renovation, and we have several programs such as. Um, student residences and um, um, how to say, um, a young, young worker hostel. So we experiment the reuse doors for the wardrobe, for the desk, for the, um, the cupboard. Here, it also same, so this is the prototypes. It's also um, um, for us, the um, an opportunity to train and uh, uh, to give qualification for some people who are in uh, integration and sometimes the people who are um, who are in the um, in the future um, hostels. So here you can see the storage in this in this site. It was possible to to make a uh, to have the storage on site, but uh, this is uh, rarely the case, as Ariane will, call you, will tell you about the, the limitations and the difficulties we can find. Yes, so we have some uh, limitations and difficulties with uh, circular economy. We have uh, three main categories. The first one is insurance, because it's uh, quite hard to reinsure 
um, to reinsure sorry reused materials and we often have to convince the insurance companies as well as the building inspection offices uh, with tests and everything to prove to them that the reused materials will be as good as the new ones. The second one is uh, the financial uh, optic obstacles uh, because uh, for now reused materials still are an additional cost and we, um, uh, according to this, we need to convince the construction company that uh, companies that we are working with, as well as our teams, uh, that um, circular economy, even though it's an additional cost in the long run, will be beneficial. And the last one is more the logistical uh, issues. Uh, so as Isabel said, the storage is uh, for now quite a huge um, restraint because if we don't have place to store the materials, it would be quite um, difficult uh, to use them. And also all the questions, um, logistic, logistical question uh, following the removal of the reused materials, uh, for example, transportation and who will pay for those materials. And last but not least, also um, the tenants' vision on uh, circular economy so that they don't feel uh, we are giving them like bad products or secondhand products, but we are giving them uh, as good as new products, even though they are being reused. So those are the four, the main limitation and difficulties. Thank you. Okay, merci Isabel and uh, Ariane for that great presentation. And I particularly appreciated your last slide when we, you looked we, at the barriers. We won because we've <laughs> we been asked to do so. <laughs> Please. Yes, um, indeed. So uh, I was saying that I really appreciate your last slide where you looked at some of the barriers, current obstacles, because I hope Philip is, uh, is taking note because note, these are the same obstacles we really see when we talk to all social housing providers who are being more circular, particularly in renovation, these issues of insurance and uh, declarations of performance and so on. So thank you for highlighting those. Um, our next speaker was supposed to be uh, Hugo de Vries. He was connected to the call, but I, I just spoke to him about two or three minutes ago. He had to urgently attend to a family matter. So unfortunately, Hugo uh, is leaving the call, or is not on the call rather. But in any case, I will quickly just flick through his slides and tell you a little bit about what he was going to say. So he works for um, a social housing company based in Uden in the Netherlands. Um, and they are really putting a strong focus on circularity. So it's, this is area one in the, the social housing company. Um, so again, I, I'm not gonna speak on behalf of Hugo, but here are the slides he was going to uh, present. They're really putting a strong focus on use of recovered materials, avoiding waste, use of biosourced materials. And what's interesting about Aria is that they're really putting this into every single one of their projects, that they're really always thinking in every project, every new project, every renovation project, how can we be as circular as possible? Hugo himself even lives in a house that is made using circular materials, which was kind of the, the test case for what they're doing in Aria. Um, as he said to me when I met him a few weeks ago, if it's good enough for our tenants, it should be good enough for the people who work for the social housing company. So they're really practicing what they preach by uh, putting circularity first in every one of their projects. So um, yeah, unfortunately Hugo had to leave us, but hopefully we can catch up with him again in the future and he have the opportunity to present uh, the work that he and his colleagues are doing. Uh, in any case, I know the slides will be shared with all attendees after the event, so you can get this information um, and maybe even reach out to Hugo and his colleagues to get some more information about what they're doing uh, in Uden. So we move on to our final speaker, which is uh, Rafael Brun. She is also an architect, um, surprise, surprise, from the Society for Housing of the Brussels Capital Region in Brussels. Uh, so someone who is quite close to, to Philip and I, I guess, and a good, uh, a good role model for people in EU institutions to learn from, perhaps. So Rafael, um, uh, I hand you the floor. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Rafael Corin from the SRB. I'm a project manager. Uh, for those who don't know who we are, the SLRB is a regional organization for social housing in Brussels. So we coordinate and support the development of social 
housing project for the 16 regional social companies of the Fortune region. Uh, the project that I will present today is developed for Binom, so one of those companies who are the future, the future housing managers and landlords. Oh. Yes. So the project I'm presenting today is called Le Clos des Mariés, uh, which could, could be translated in something like the Wedded Garden and consists of the major renovation of three existing buildings into 31 social housing units. Uh, for this project, so in partnership with BNOM, we have set ourselves important objectives in terms of circularity. So first of all, uh, we started from an existing site. A few years ago, uh, the region acquired the site of the former gendarmerie barracks in XL which is now called U Square. Uh, the first building on the site was constructed around 1906, and the site, the site continued to grow and change until a few years ago when it was sold by the army. And the site offers today a series of buildings, uh, still actually in very good condition, as they were occupied until recently. Therefore, the site has a very important capacity of reconversion allowing to limit not only new constructions, but also we have very few demolitions and there are therefore raw material consumptions and most of all the treatment, the treatment of waste. Uh, in terms of programming, the, the site is also extremely well placed. It is located in a very lively area of XL, so it's very well connected to the public transport uh, close to important uh, commercial, cultural area, and very close to some part of the Brussels University. Uh, it's ease of access at its connections, uh, therefore presents a very important potential for relocation as much now than in the future. So there was no need to create any additional connections or facility for its use as most of the needed installation were actually already there. Um, still regarding the general program, as you can see, the site is quite big and offers a large number of buildings for reuse. Um, and the reason I chosen to propose a mix of program on this site by installing premises of the University of Brussels, public spaces, shops, uh, student housing and social housing in order to open up the site and participate in the life of the district and add a new dynamic to this district. So for the Clos des Mariers, the buildings are located in the south of the, the site. It's the red buildings that you can see here. On one end, uh, these buildings originally housed the families of uh, Marie Gendarmes and they were therefore initially designed as housing buildings. In the 1980s, as they became too small to accommodate every family, they were transformed into offices. And with the new project, we will actually return to their original purpose. On the other hand, the choice of this area for housing is quite urbanistically logical because it is in transition uh, between the activity areas that are located in the center of the site and uh, the surrounding residential areas. So if we look at the buildings in detail, first of all, what we did was a general, a general sorry, inventory, uh, which allowed us to define the ambition and potential of the project that we wanted to see. So for each material, we made like cars, um, in which we, we, we put it every details of materials. The inventory allowed us to analyze the, the general condition of the buildings, the possibility of dismantling, and the quality of equipment and materials that are still in place. And it was really important that the inventory was realized at the early beginning of the project, because it is a tool that we are using during all the phases and that will allow us to set realistic goals as much as, much as uh, ensure not to miss any opportunities. 
So on this basis, we defined a series of objectives that the architects had to achieve and present in the architectural competition. And these objectives are setting a minimum rate of conservation of the existing building, a minimum rate of recycled materials, and the use of reclaimed, reclaimed materials. So once again, it's really important that these goals are set at this stage and the inventory given to the competitors that, as it can be implemented in every aspect of the conception and possibly questioned by the architects. Uh, so to ensure the follow-up in all the phases of the conception, the architects have to keep a monitoring table that we, you can see an extract here, uh, up to date from the competition until the end of constructions. So it allows us to know at any time where we are regarding these objectives and what to do when we make decisions. So on this basis, today's project proposed a conservation rate of 83%, which was originally set at 60%, so it's quite good. They went even more far than what we asked at the beginning. It also favors reclaimed materials on site as much as possible in order to limit the processing pr procedures. Uh, the reused ma materials are mainly the bricks, the blue stones, the slates, and paving stones from the outside. Uh, for new materials that were integrated, we also try to use as much as possible reclaimed materials. Sorry. For instance, for the steel, and the wood of the terrace that you can see here. Uh, the structures has to be from reclaimed materials or the tiling in the kitchen and the bathrooms. So we studied a uh, different technique for managing reuse materials. Uh, as I said, in this project, we have chosen to use some of the materials on site and we will ask the company to sell the rest of the material in good, condition, in good condition on the market. So this way, the company will be able to benefit from the added value of the sale. And we really hope that uh, this choice will encourage them to collaborate. For the new elements, we ask the architect to come up with really simple and reversible design elements. For instance, uh, the assembly of the metal structure of the terrace must be carried out mechanically so that the assembly and disassembly is easy. The same applies to technical equipment, which should be easy to maintain and for which spare parts are really, readily available uh, on the market, which will ensure a long service life. Uh, for the technical parts, uh, everything is new. Uh, as maintenance is quite complicated in social housing, but we tried to choose energy efficient equipment as much as possible and find a balance between technicity and uh, simplified maintenance. Uh, so right now we are currently studying the work contracts. So it's actually is the phase that where we find uh, the most questions and difficulties arise, uh, even though the questions are generally, generally more legal than technical. Uh, first of all, we have to find a way to involve the, the, the construction company in the circular ambitions, so they carry the objectives with us. Uh, to do so, we ask them that they submit a note describing their methodology and ambition, ambitions when applying. And this note will be rated and is actually really a part of the uh, awarding criteria. As I explained a little bit earlier, we also try to find them economical interests, such as bonuses, uh, whether they meet or exceed the target sets. But we are currently looking on how to do so because it's not so easy in public procurement. We are also looking for ways for them to find economical interest in the selling process, as I was explaining a little bit earlier. Uh, for the on-site reuse, the storage question, as we saw in the previous presentation, is really important. Luckily, on this project, we have enough space on-site, so we are able to provide 
on-site storage space to facilitate the interventions, but it could really be a big problem in different conditions. Uh, the issue that concerns us the most right now is the certification of materials, obviously. Uh, for the finishing elements, as the clients, we have to take our own responsibility and accept a level of finishing that will obviously not that will obviously not be the same as new materials, but we have to clearly establish now uh, the limits in the, in the specific specification, sorry, that we accept or no. For the stability elements, such as the steel structure, uh, we have defined a series of tests to be carried out uh, beforehand in order to check the steel qualities. We also asked the engineers uh, to study different possibilities depending on the type of beams that the company will found during the construction. Finally, the question of reclaimed materials poses um, an uncertainty for the quantity of materials found and their price, especially at the time of construction, which in the framework of public procurement must be fixed in advance. So it's quite a problem that we are working on right now to find ways to open and up the market. So in conclusions, we are trying to find ways to open the market and anticipate uh, sufficient flexibility so that the construction company will not be scared and uh, we really hope that this final collaboration will work and that we will achieve the objectives that we set ourselves. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very, very much, uh, Rafael. I should also say Rafael is, is joined, uh, just to side by her colleague uh, Guillaume, who we didn't see. Hello, Guillaume. Um, if I could ask all of the panelists who remain to please turn back on their cameras. So we're going to move now to um, really what I think might be the most interesting part of this is the roundtable discussion where we each have the opportunity to discuss with each other. Uh, so Philippe, I, I, I hope you were listening and taking notes from the presentations. So maybe I could ask you to give some thoughts about what you have heard from the from the three speakers. Maybe some new information that you heard that could be interesting to to feed into your own work in the Commission, or maybe any questions you might have for any of the speakers uh, from the European Union point of view. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm, I'm glad I can hear, hear everybody now because I had problems earlier on with my headset. But anyway, um, it, it was. Uh, really interesting to hear all the speakers um it's always good to hear examples from concrete projects on the ground and, and you know real experiences of what people are finding i think that um the some of the barriers that were presented are you know they're familiar ones that we those of us working in circular economy and construction are unfortunately familiar with these barriers there's the the cost of the secondary materials versus the new materials the administrative difficulty you know it's easier just to uh, click on a catalog uh, digitally and order new material than it is to sort, sort and find uh, secondary materials um, there's the the logistical problems that we saw which is that that's really something that is probably more relevant to deal with in policies at local level or you know local and regional level because they're very localized kind of issues um, but it is a, a major barrier we know of where to store secondary materials um, who pays for the storage who owns it you know when you demolish a building uh, or you know demolish the works who, who owns that stuff and, and takes responsibility for it um, these are all kinds of, of familiar kind of barriers. I think definitely the um, the policies that are coming through at our level, at EU level, especially related to the construction products regulation and the, the digital information, that should really uh, help a lot, I think. Um, once we have harmonized product data, uh, we should be in a better position to be able to compare different uh, compare the same products across you know the rivals of different companies uh compare a brick with a secondary brick say or or a, 
window or whatever it is, um, and compare them along environmental criteria, not only uh, you know cost and, um, uh, and 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 things like that. So uh, at the moment, it's very difficult to do that with the revision of the regulation. And and as a as an EU regulation, it would apply as regulations do equally across all member states. Um, then that would really, um, you know, that that would be something of a game changer, I think. Um, so we're very hopeful of that. The the downside of that of the construction products regulation is it's a slow process. It's we're still uh, looking at, uh, you know, we, we, the Commission proposal has come out. It's now being looked at by the Council and the Parliament. Um, it's going to be a few more months at least for them to conclude their own positions before they start negotiating with each other. Um, so we're looking at uh, months or years um, before this comes into force. And then after the regulation has been agreed, if it's agreed, then we would have um, following that a series of separate legal acts, like the delegated acts or implementing acts as they're called, um, to, to bring in the different uh, specific criteria for different product categories. So we might start to see things like, um, uh, you know, minimum recycle content, for example, for certain types of products where that is appropriate. Um, but uh, nevertheless, I think that, you know, the, the construction products regulation is not the only thing we're doing. And um, there are the taxonomy is another one, uh, you know, with the draft criteria out now that should at least help the demand. Um, but we need to we need to act simultaneously on the demand and the supply. So there needs to be more demand for secondary products. And that's probably coming from things like um, green public procurement criteria and the taxonomy and these kinds of things that are, you know, uh, demand led and then the also the increased supply of secondary materials as well at the same time so it's uh you know a, a lot of things need to happen at once but it's it's really good to see um individual projects really making an effort to push the boundaries of what's possible because where that that really helps us when we're trying to produce policies we look at what the front runners are doing um and and what's possible uh because the more they're pushing the more we can push the policies uh, following that. So thanks. Okay, thank you, Philippe. And uh, I hope this next part will be uh, good for you as well. So I'm going to also offer, open it up to the three speakers and offer them the possibility probably to come back maybe to some of what you've dis discussed in your presentation and just in your answer now, and maybe provide some views from the ground about how well the current system, at least, uh, of EU regulations and local regulations are working or not working um, in terms of the work on circular economy. So maybe I can come to Carles and David first. Do you have any questions or comments for, for Philippe? Thank you, Dara. Yes, we are having a lot of questions that have been very, very helpful for us. So the first task is that um, we're having some inconvenience uh, promoting this way of working with lobbies and parties of the position criticizing our work, uh, saying that we're wasting uh, public funds uh, in, in stuff, like uh, saying that sustainability is not something that deserves all these things. But it really would help us, really would help us have something very strong to provide to all the regional um, governments in the European Commission to provide a very like strong frame saying that this is what you are supposed to do. Because at this point, there is still a lot of people that think that we are just um, doing some caprichos, no? something not really necessary. So that would be the first step. The second step, I think, is related to a kind of um peripheral condition which is that of course we have to promote uh this eco-friendly transition of the mass produced products but i'm pretty sure that the conditions in all the peripheral areas in all europe has to be pretty much the same which is about 
all these artisan local produced products that they are under extension. So in many places, they have already achieved extinction. I think in the North countries, this is happening pretty much. But maybe in the Southern countries, like Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, Greece, I don't know, maybe some places in, in Germany, whatever, there are all these, this heritage of products that they don't have the tools or, or the money um, to get access to labels, to studies, um, to all this kind of, um, let's say, conditions that will, that will be necessary to sell your product as eco-friendly in the future. There are a lot of very small companies that they won't have like the, the tools to provide that. So maybe we should think in the same way of the food that you have like mass produced food and very artisan like food, like it happens with the artisan cheese in France, for instance, that they have different regulations for that. Just something that we, we need in order to not to lose all these materials that right now they're available in the Balearic Islands and in 10 years, they won't be there if we are not changing the situation. Um, a third problem that we're having is that um, it's difficult to find um, control companies, technical control companies, um, to, pro to provide uh, the reports in order to achieve the insurance that is a need for every housing building. So it would be very interesting if that could be pushed uh, from the European Commission to make easier to find that companies. At the moment, we are we're just fine. We have found at least one company in every specific project, but um, it's something that it requires a lot of effort. So what is going to happen to every company that is following the same path that we're doing right now is that everything it takes 10 times the regular effort. So some people uh, will face that effort and probably some people won't. And I think we have a last question, which is that usually um, the national regulations are currently based specifically on standard construction solutions, mainly, for instance, in Spain, steel and concrete. And if we want to provide an easier frame for all the designers in order to reuse to introduce recycled materials as we all all the teams that today we present this all of us we're working with recycled stuff and everything and natural materials probably we need to expand these regulations so that the responsibility of the technicians is more easily covered okay uh, I think uh, that's already four I think very very good questions and indeed I should say that as part of the household project one of the things we have delivered and will be online very shortly, I hope, is a set of policy recommendations. I think about 90 policy recommendations related to the circular economy. And indeed, these questions about insurance, for example, C markings and so on, they're things that come up again and again and again across all the conversations we have. So it's really something that we we see is a, is a barrier or an obstacle that needs to be overcome in some way. Um, hey, Lisa, I sorry, I, I forgot to mention the last one. Sorry, um, which is, um, at the energy efficiency a draft that was approved, I believe, in 2021, uh, there is this definition of zero emissions building, which is extremely important that includes the embodied emissions during the construction if we want, if we want to promote the change. If the embodied energy is not included and we talk only on the, about the energy in the useful life, we are lost. Indeed. Okay, I might uh, go to Paris now. Maybe it's easier to take the questions all together because there probably will be some overlap and I realize that we're running a bit out of time. So maybe uh, Isabel and Ariane, if you have uh, any thoughts or any questions for, for Philippe at the European Commission. Sorry, sorry. 
Um, no, it's not really a, a question, but I would like to insist on the, the financial obstacles. Um, policies help, but sometimes it could be an additional cost. For example, the um, resource inventory, uh, mm -hmm. which is in France, I don't know, in, in other countries, it, it is a um, obligatoire. Um, uh, mandatory. Mandatory, yes. Uh, and for sometimes for the light renovation, it's a, a big. It represents a, a big cost for um, not a lot um, um, result because uh, we don't have so many uh, equipment to reuse on this type uh, of project. So uh, I just want to say that uh, warning: the policies sometimes uh, helps, but. Um, it could be also um, a, a barrier, a, a break. <laughs> okay, perfect. And then uh, lastly to Rafael and uh, Guillaume, if you have any questions or thoughts for, for Philippe. Um, it's not really a question, but yeah, well, more, yeah. Uh, how, how is it going to happen in, in, the, in the EU? Uh, so in, here in Brussels, we have a, a tool that is developed uh, by the region, uh, which is called Total, which is a life cycle uh, analysis tool used in construction, and it, and we use it. And I think it is meant to uh, be linked to the EPB uh, software that we use in Brussels. Um, so my question would be. Um, uh, is there a link between both EPB and uh, life cycle analysis? And it, it, it joined the question of, uh, of, uh, of our colleagues from uh, Spain, uh, which is, uh, yeah, the embodied energy should be also uh, calculated as the energy that is used during the lifetime of the building. So uh, both subjects are linked uh, in our mind, uh, but we don't, exactly know how it will be handled by the team. And we have a second? Okay. Yes, the second one is more a remark than a question, but we noticed in this project that on the early stages, it's quite easy to find a partner, or many partners are, are interested in circular questions. When, when we're stuck and where we can find the most problems, it's at the... Upscale. No. Not necessarily upscaling, but at the construction moment, because in uh, in in public procurements, the main criteria is the price, obviously, and so to find companies are uh, enough. I don't know how to say, but sensibilized maybe is quite hard in this dynamic because the main subject is the price, and so to discuss of anything else is really complicated. Yes, absolutely. That's something that we we find also in, in the research recommendations coming from, from the Hasro project. If I could just throw in one uh, last point, I see it came up in the chat a few times, which is the issue of building material passports. So it's something we are developing, or we have used in the Hasro project, but I know it's far from being mainstreamed, and I'm wondering maybe if the European Commission has even thought to, at least for, let's say, new buildings, to increase the use of building material passports or even potentially make them mandatory in order to help to progress in the future of the secondary market for, for materials. So, Philippe, we are coming up close to the time. I think we can probably go a few minutes over time, provided you don't have to run away on us. So maybe there's a lot of questions that were there. As best as possible, in four or five minutes, maybe you can try to give some replies. Thanks. Uh, yes, very interesting questions. I count uh, nine or ten questions. <laughs> I've made notes of them. Um, they're all very relevant. I think the very first point uh, was an important one on the top level political messaging. Um, I think there's no doubt that this commission under Ursula von der Leyen is very ambitious when it comes to environment and climate and circular economy. So to anyone who tells you that it's not a priority, they're simply wrong. It's a very, very high priority at the EU level. Um, this is why, you know, uh, we keep talking uh, in, in DG Grow in, in my uh, part of the commission 
and we're responsible for industry after all so you you might expect the industry dg to be the one that is uh industry you know industry friendly but uh sometimes you might think we're not friendly to the environment that's actually completely the opposite of what's true because we keep talking about the digital and green transition as two things together um especially in the light of the recovery from the pandemic so um there are plenty of uh eu policies that have come out recently highlighting the importance of uh the circular economy as the future of you know of our economy so we're we're undergoing now a gradual shift from a linear to a circular economy which is going to take time but uh, you know the the work that all of you people are doing is is part of that and it's all really important um the thing about the artisanal products and and the labels um i think that in general what's you know the the thing about labels and certifications on uh, construction works and construction products is um the importance of having harmonized eu systems um we have a in place we have in place the levels framework which is not a certification scheme but it is a framework for measuring and reporting against environmental indicators for buildings and um so it's it is a harmonized way to ensure that the calculations for the different um environmental indicators including uh life cycle emissions um but also other uh, there are, i think there are 16 indicators in total that, that you know anything that's aligned with levels is good um and some of the major certification schemes that you know and, and you probably are familiar with with several of them they are gradually aligning with our eu levels scheme so that's uh, that's definitely a way to go there um the levels uh, framework was developed together with industry and member states and it's it's online on the commission's website there's guidance there are training materials available for people to learn how to use it um so that's uh, that's very helpful in that sense um the point about um insurance uh and the maybe the unfamiliarity of uh, circular approaches to insurance companies i think that that will come with uh more familiarity in a sense uh i think the you know the insurance companies do tend to be quite conservative but sometimes for good reason for for safety and things like that um so these are the kinds of things that the revision of the construction products regulation should help with to have harmonized rules in place uh for secondary materials so that they're insurable in the same way as as new materials or new products are um the there was a, a question on um zero emission buildings and embodied emissions um i didn't i didn't go into i could have gone into a great load of detail on that in my slides but i stuck to more of the material side of things but um the whole life cycle emissions is a a very important part of of my work and also colleagues i'm working with in the commission there's a a revision undergoing of the energy performance of buildings directive um which is looking to uh, move away from purely looking at energy efficiency in in building regulations and go to a life cycle approach based on the whole life cycle emissions now what's happening here is that the commission's proposal which was published would require all new buildings to calculate and declare their life cycle emissions only to do that to calculate and declare but we know that in some member states like in France and also in several of the nordic countries um there are laws in place now setting maximum limits to life cycle emissions um that isn't in the commission proposal however the european parliament has proposed amendments to this uh to our proposal that would set uh limits and would require the member states to draw up national road maps setting dates of when they set the limits um this hasn't yet you know this is still under negotiation with the the member states and the council so we don't know yet what the outcome will be of the energy performance of buildings directive but just so you know that that is an active point of discussion and uh, the life cycle emissions um it seems likely at this stage we will at least have a mandatory calculation for new buildings because um 
uh, neither the Council or the Parliament has yet proposed to drop that part of it in the negotiations. The financial obstacles, um, which we're well aware of, of course, um, one of the things I can think of that could help that is the, the taxonomy that I mentioned in the slides. Um, for example, the existing criteria for climate mitigation, so um, these tend to be energy efficiency uh, measures in buildings. Um, some of the major financial players like the European Investment Bank, they tend to align with the taxonomy criteria. So um, if the, the new criteria that we've just brought out for circular economy go the same way, you know, it's possible that big money like the European Investment Bank or, or other financial players will start putting money into alignment with the taxonomy on circular uh, circular economy. And that would be a, a big, you know, a big help in, in um, financing. Uh, where um, you spoke about the totem tool, which uh, I know of, and it's a, it's a really good tool for life cycle analysis. And, and there are other tools as well. There are national tools. There are also, you know, private sector ones. Um, I think that this uh, this is linked to the earlier point on the, on the life cycle emissions. Um, so uh, and the energy performance of buildings directive. Um, all I would say there is that there's certainly a move overall to look more at the life cycle where we are moving, you know, slowly in policies and also in in practices now um, away from just looking at the how much energy buildings consume to the whole life cycle emissions. And so we expect that the tools would would evolve um, uh, to reflect that. Um, then uh, the price being the main criteria in procurement. Um, another thing I didn't mention in my slides that um, but the Commission is working at the moment on new uh, green public procurement criteria for buildings. Uh, and these, I think, are expected to be published towards the end of this year. So they're under development, but that would help as well. So we would have EU-wide green public procurement criteria that then procurers can use. Uh, and we certainly support uh, green public procurement um, so that, you know, not only price is the criterion. And the final one on material passports. Um, this again goes back to the construction products regulation and the, the harmonized data. So um, there are material passports that exist out there at the moment, um, but they're not harmonized at EU level. So, so this is one of another one of the things that the regulation could, could help with. Um, and we are also uh, in DG Grow, we're working on uh, a possible EU framework for a digital building logbook. So this would be the material passport plus other data like the energy performance certificate, um, the you know the BIM model of the building and various other things all together in one digital um, digital place for the building. Um, it's an active area of development, but there's not yet any any proposal to make it mandatory. Um, we, we still have to work out the feasibility of how it would work and but we know of um, existing uh, initiatives at national level. So for the moment, um, that's what we have. I think that's answered all of the ones I wrote down. Um, but yes, uh, and, yeah, interesting questions. Thanks. Thank you. I, I think, yes, I, I also made a note. So I think you answered, or at least tried to answer all the questions that were asked. Um, I know it's 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 often difficult when all the pressure and all the focus is on you, um, but I think you, you handled it very well. And I think you gave some good replies to to the, the people who asked the questions. And indeed, I guess the overall summary would be that we're working on it, right? So that we, we know that these issues exist, but we already have various frameworks, regulations, updates, and so on that are in the pipeline that hopefully in the very near future or not so distant future will help us to really move towards greater circularity and that the front runners that we, we heard from today will then form the basis for other people to copy what they've what they've been doing. So um, with that, I know we ran a little bit over time. I thank you all for your patience. Um, I thank you all for your attendance, for your presentations, for your questions. Uh, I think it was a very, very interesting session. I'm sure most of you could have spoken all day uh, or at least spoken uh, to Philip uh, for most of the day because indeed you're very passionate about this topic, as are we in Housing Europe. Um, 
to conclude, I would just say that uh, next week we have the final event, which is also online, the final event for the Hessel project, which I said um, is why we're kind of here today. So that project really focused on deep circular renovation of buildings in Austria and in, and in Spain. We'll have the final event in which we'll go through all of the results that we've had over the past five years or so. It's been a very long project, mostly thanks to COVID. But look, I thank you very much for your participation here today, for the support for, from BuildUp and other partners involved in today's event. Um, and yes, with that, I will close. So thank you very, very much. From BuildUp, a big thank you to all you, the speakers, and also to the audience for attending today's webinar. A reminder that you will be able to find the recording of the BuildUp portal and on our YouTube channel in the coming days, together with the slides. Uh, as that, that I was saying, the next webinar of the Drive Zero series will be held on the 27th of April, and you can check it on the BuildUp events calendar for more information and for the registration. Kind reminder, as you were talking now, that the BuildUp uh, May's topic of the month will be on building life cycle assessment. So we will be talking a lot more about these issues so keep informed in the portal. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thank you very much.